Guten Aufhebung, Leute! In this video, I'll showcase this interactive, circular, sunburst visualization of a philosophical system once crafted by a German philosopher called Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. I'll talk about the process I've gone through to create this visualization and how you can use D3.js to make sunburst visualizations of your own and spend a little bit of time exploring and justifying why it's particularly fun to take this system and create it as a circular visualization because the philosopher themselves has said that philosophy proper should be seen as a circle of circles. So let's get going. Here we have the interactive version. We've got about 1,900 categories in the system and we can navigate it by clicking through the pie slices. And this is all coming from the D3 sunburst example logic. So we actually can get up and running pretty quickly. Something like this. The system itself we can dive into, but uh, it splits into three uh, strange sounding bits. Logic, how to think things, how does thought think things, nature, and then something that sounds a bit spooky, the spirit, uh, which in its German sense is perhaps a lot more mundane and could be read as something like mind or intersubjective mind instead, instead of any kind of supernatural uh, ectoplasm or anything like that. So we have this uh, navigable structure. This is what we've ended up with. And this is all hosted on Observable HQ, which is a great place for you to freely uh, fork and edit uh, D3 visualizations. So we'll see that instead of looking at the whole bundle of HTML, CSS, we've got the key JavaScript with D3 uh, editable right here. This is all it takes for the sunburst. And if we make changes here and press the play button, we'll see the changes right here in the live system online. So this makes kind of collaborating on data visualizations really fun and easy. All right, so let's take a little bit of a look at the logic behind this. So this is a coding video and not a uh, philosophy video. But I'll just take one quote from the encyclopedia logic. Why use circles? So the quote goes, each of the parts of philosophy is a philosophical whole, a circle rounded and complete in itself. In each of these parts, however, the philosophical idea is found in a particular specificality or medium. The single circle, because it is a real totality, bursts through the limits imposed by its special medium and gives rise to a wider circle. The whole of philosophy, in this way, resembles a circle of circles. The idea, it's a special technical term, appears in each single circle, but at the same time, the whole idea is constitutive by the system of these peculiar phases, and each is a necessary member of the organization. So there's something to chew on, um, but the metaphor of a circle of circles is very vividly there, uh, despite uh, Hegel elsewhere kind of warning against this kind of visualizing picture thinking uh, as a poor substitute for thinking through the subject matter itself. This gives a bit of a textual justification for why things might be in a circle. Um, another related thing here is that in the progress of the system, um, there are cases where things seemingly do loop around from being to essence, I'm not going to dive into it, to concept all the way to the highest development, in a sense, of the concept and the idea, at the level of the absolute idea, we then kind of end up looping back over into indeterminate being, perhaps from a more refined and comprehending vantage point. So there is this circularity, seemingly, purportedly, baked in. And then we also have the sliding through, or the transition between these areas. So something's looping, maybe thought, uh, thinking itself in the logic is looping through itself, but then also slips into nature, realizes that actually what is being is nature, 
goes through the steps um, that have been set into nature, and I think this is the most controversial part of the system uh, these days, because natural science and our understanding of the natural world in particular has vastly advanced in the last 200 years. Nonetheless, from nature, there is a transition to this intersubjective mind, things like cultural practices, uh, personality, morality, and then ways of attempting to comprehend the world, such as art, uh, religion, as well uh, as it's not a surprise to hear from a philosopher's point of view, philosophy at its highest peak. And finally, we would then imagine that, uh, or, or are told, that as spirit comes more and more free, spirit is freedom, um, finds itself in the world and understands that more and more uh, freedom that it has, it has less and less limitation coming from the outside, and what limits is, is itself, um, its comprehension of itself grows, and as that gets to the level of explicit um, ability to analyze itself, we get philosophy, which then culminates in some respect in this notion that, oh, one should have a systematic view of the world, systematic philosophy, which then fuses together, so it's told, this uh, absolute spirit philosophy at the peak with the uh, logic. And wouldn't you know it, at the pinnacle of philosophy is German idealism, a uh, school that Hegel was part of, and um, perhaps at the peak of this we have Hegel. Um, and then we see this recursion happening if we go all the way to the top of the system. So there are these fun things happening. Fun things happening in the system if you uh, start thinking about it in the circular way as has been mentioned. Or you can go for little explorations, see what you can find. Let's see if I can find a llama over here. Uh, go to animal life and genus. Find animals in a taxonomy that doesn't really make sense in our day. Uh, to the umbilicals, where is the llama? It's a land mammal for sure. Ungulate, pachyderm, sounds about right. Ruminant, telepoda, and there we have llamas. All the way at 2.3.3.1.2.3.3.3.3.2.1.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.2.
the good then get to a point where spirit comes to this greater and greater understanding of itself as we give these normative accounts of ourselves as persons, as communities, as, uh, through institutions and such, coming to be limited in some sense by nothing by itself because it discovers its otherness elsewhere. And then sort of through this process is brought to understand the world as system and contemplate logic again. So the self-winding circle is perhaps operative here. Now, that's a bit cheeky. Of course, this is a bit old and there are things here that are brilliant and things that might cause some consternation. But that's why this kind of system, as complex, convoluted and uh, intricate as it is, which explicitly says that philosophy is a circle of circles, is fun to visualize as a set of circles, which is exactly why I chose the sunburst type. So that's the philosophical side. That's this visualization. Have a look at it. Have fun with it. Interrogate it. Um, I'm sure it could be improved a lot, especially by getting links to materials to study, because these rubrics on their own can be confusing, are confusing, can even be offensive, and in some cases grossly uh, off or wrong comparative to our taxonomy of animals, for example, that we have today. So this is just what I've gone to with this visualization so far. Let's move on to actually looking at the D3 implementation of this, the code part of this video. And this is simply a fork of the zoomable sunburst branch that there is in Observable HQ. I think that's created by Mike Bostock himself, who's the creator of D3.js. It's an excellent, really organized piece of code. And we have the uh, D3 here. Uh, but really, what you could do if you wanted your own sunburst, uh, the absolutely key thing to do is to have your data structure right. Once you've got the data structure right, and then you plug it in, everything else will flow from that. D3 is a open source library full of components that you can bring in to build visualizations uh, on the web and you know, relying a lot on functional programming. So if you have a data structure, then you run a function on it and then get things to uh, appear uh, very, very nicely, very efficiently, very uh, appropriately for interactive visualizations. So step one, let's look at how is the data structured? So the system here is a JSON file. And we have a few pieces of data in there. We have the whole hierarchy, in this case, about uh, 10,000 rows of data. And it is simply consisting of the name of the given level, any children it might have, an ID at that level, and a value. The value informs how big a slice the sunburst should have. We'll look at that a bit later. But that's the basic idea. Uh, easier said than done sometimes. So what did I do to build this view? I mapped out the structure in a CSV, and it's pretty simple and you could uh, replicate this process easily. So I've got the location in the hierarchy mapped out in this kind of index, separated by numbers. I've got the name, that corresponds, so this would correspond to the ID in the JSON. This corresponds to the name. Then we have the parent. So the parent is just one level up. So if being is 1.1, its parent is gonna be one, which is logic, and so on. That's all very clear. And what's the value? Well, the value was uh, what informs the sunburst visualization, how big a slice relative to others should there be. And um, it depends on how deep you are in the hierarchy. So it's got these tiny values, and but what it's essentially doing is we know that I know that I want the beginning here to have um, a third each. Each of these slices of the system should be a third each, and as long as there are three children, it should kind of split into three, because Hegel loved threes. Sometimes the 
split makes a lot of sense. Sometimes, like, basic elements of air, fire and water, and earth. Cramming four elements into three segments, very obviously doesn't quite fit. Nonetheless, um, that's how we're structuring it. Makes it at least for a beautiful layeration. So, we need to have the right ratio in the value. So, what I did was I took the amount, I calculated the amount of uh, siblings that there are for any given level. So, if there is determinateness here, that's uh, a child of being, I would count how many other children in the whole hierarchy are there. Well, there's going to be three. Sometimes there's two, maybe sometimes there's one. Um, that's going to be one part of the calculation. So starting from this one-third, we divide it by that, and then um, also the depth of how deep you are. So you can see that the deeper you are in the system, uh, the smaller the value, and they kind of sum up nicely to that third of any given level because I know exactly the... Uh, so here we see these two numbers, because there's only two children, we get a sum of 0 0.041, which is matches what you should expect at that higher level, um, even when you have three, uh, three children. So at that depth in the system, you're going to end up with the same sum uh, from the children. So it's making a nice and even visualization. If you don't care about that, you can just mm, use the values to display more information, essentially. Maybe there is a proportion. If you're thinking of a uh, displaying the size of files on your hard drive, um, you want to maybe have the sizes of the slices very much relative to the size uh, of the file. Okay, so that's in CSV, but that's not yet JSON. We wanted it in a uh, very specific JSON format, nested exactly right. So I created uh, just a script in Python to do this conversion, grabbing in the CSV, reading that data, creating a set of nodes um, with the ID, the name and value, and then going through them, placing the parentage properly um, by looking at that parent column once we've created all the nodes and then outputting that as JSON. So I'll include this in the video notes for you to take a look at. But that's the basic idea. And, you know, depending on how exactly you structure your data, you might need to tinker with this. But the key thing is to get this JSON done. And then when you've done that, when you've forked the Sunburst code, you can just upload the file and it will work. So that's, that's one of the beauties of working like this. So there we have the data side covered in some detail. Get your data right, and everything else will follow a lot easier. And of course, that uh, time-wise took me the biggest chunk in building this by categorizing these 2,000 slightly under uh, categories where I did have the uh, Sierpinski triangle visualization available at hegel.net as my source, which goes a little bit beyond Hegel's own text. So let's move on to some of the things we can tinker up here in the code. So there's quite a bit going on. We see that the data is partitioned, so it's split into the ways we expect. Uh, there's a partition method lower down. We get this basic SVG created, set the font that then is inherited, set the width and height as a square, and start appending paths, so these slices with um, visibility being set by the data. So one of the great things about D3 is you have these uh, functions, you have that then fill these uh, HTML attributes. So it really makes it powerful to have, you know, manipulate hundreds or thousands of HTML things at once. This adds the uh, click to all of the uh, elements so that uh, it knows that these are clickable things and if any one of them is clicked then the click method which we'll find lower down uh, will be called. Here we start appending some text so this um, handles the tooltip 
the main title handles what shows here and the label itself handles what shows in these texts and at the moment it just cuts it off and puts an ellipsis when the text is longer because sometimes it is rather long that's what this method here in the text segment in these chained methods does now if you've not used d3 before it may take some getting used to there's a, something of a learning curve to it um, uh, but there are great materials available online courses books articles and examples uh, as observable hq has plenty of examples to poke around in and it's just so fun to tinker with these get the circle in the middle we get um, calculation of the right points for the um, slices to begin from based on the depth and width uh, we can set the time for the duration should the transition be slow or fast this transitions all the arcs so this is something I didn't create this came with the d3 you might not want to do it uh, tweak yourself this does all the, uh, the fancy transitions, tweening it, interpolating it between the current state and the target state. Uh, adjusts the labels as well, hides ones that should be hidden, moves them in the right place. Now, here we have three layers visible, the center and three layers. In this section, with the arc visible, label visible, you can adjust how many layers show. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 at the moment. Um, so three act actual layers of both labels and arcs, so of those pie slices. Here um, this code accesses the data in the attached file. Here's that partition method where I've changed the sorting a little bit just to make sure it sorts uh, the way I want and some key parameters at the bottom so i adjusted a bit of the width and the radius to get it to play nice and maybe you can adjust here in this key arc method d3 arc you know you get the start and end angle which get determined by the calculations we did before you might change the padding uh, radius around the padding explore with the various variables there and that's it um, I wonder if I was clear enough. A couple of things just to mention what I changed and what I didn't mention was the coloration actually. So if you wanted to change coloration, you can change this um, method. We can interpolate something else, sign bow, let's say, instead of rainbow. Press play and uh, get a totally different coloration based on that preset interpolation. And there's a bunch of these available and the documentation tends to be pretty good. Switch it back to rainbow, press play, and that's active again. So I'll cover a few things that I've changed just to give you a sense of my process. Played around with the colors, of course, played around with the fonts, the sizes. Um, added this, uh, mechanism to show uh, the path uh, with the IDs so that if you hover over the tool bot top tip you'll see the full path how does one get to that level in the system um, I added this main title at the center and this uh, truncation where necessary course a bit of the same thing with the uh, the main text in the middle truncating it where necessary and then not that much to change I increased the depth from two levels to this three of those actual layers of the system visible I think it looks a lot better like that one two three maybe some variable tweaking in terms of the padding and small things with the layout make it look nicer and there's plenty more to do um, but that was really it so it looks fancy because the data structure built by others is fancy and that just cobbled it together 
but really the magic is in that structure being uh, harmonious enough to yield itself for this kind of visualization and for uh, the sunburst visualization example that we can fork being so very, very powerful. I think of that looks and works so smoothly we can navigate elsewhere. And a lot of development ideas come to mind where to take this, maybe uh, more links to reading material around all these topics or um, options for commentary. And of course, little UX improvements like maybe splitting these on many rows, making it easy to see the full name without hovering, hovering over it. Um, well, there we go. That's a bit of a tour, a showcase of this fun project I've done recently, just now, and uh, posted online, seemingly to people's delight, or at least stimulation of some kind. Hopefully this gives you uh, some uh, in level of intrigue, either into D3, uh, interactive visualizations in general, or maybe this uh, a somewhat esoteric strand of philosophy, trying to uh, systematize thought. Uh, though. I suppose the contention would be this is something that every epoch, maybe every person, needs to do uh, by themselves or over again. Uh, it's only going to be relevant for the time that has already passed. As long as time passes onwards, one needs to think through the system and augment it, and update the bits on nature, update the bits that uh, match the current historical moment and so on. Something to keep you busy if you are so inclined. But there we go. Let me know if there's anything else you'd like to hear from me or uh, if anything was particularly unclear uh, in this Cody philosophy video. And I hope you have a fantastic time, whatever you're doing or thinking. Thanks for watching and catch you later.